Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday morning, I was up at 4am, so I could watch what was probably going to be NASA's second biggest launch of the year. The Perseverance rover on an Atlas 541 headed off to Mars and expected to arrive and land at Jezero Crater on 18th of February 2021. And if everything really goes to plan in the long term, some bits of that thing might be coming back in 2030 or maybe later. The launch vehicle was an Atlas V 541, that means 5 meter fairings, 4 uh, solid rocket motors which make the white smoke and 1 RL-10 engine. And it was pretty much flawless. Atlas has been an amazing reliable launch vehicle. Except for one problem, if you look in the lower left at that launch telemetry, never mind, look at the, uh, look at the transonic effects there as it passes through the sound barrier. That was uh, you know, great to see the rainbow effect there. Anyway. In the bottom left, you'll notice that they got the velocity and altitude wrong. So those, the velocity and altitude there are clearly in kilometers per hour, but whoever designed the graphic decided to say that they were in miles and MP slash H, which I'm not even sure what that is. That's miles per per hour, right? Or I don't know. Anyway, look, that was obviously garbage, but it is possibly a, a port that might worry some long-time Mars watchers after the loss of Mars Climate Orbiter due to a mix-up between metric and uh, imperial. In this case, I'm sure that the, if the mistake is only in those on-screen graphics. There's nothing in the back-end software or navigation that's going to be affected by this, but it is pretty funny. And you know, if you have any doubt about this, then uh, the rocket actually put the thing into a target orbit, which was pretty much bang on within a kilometer of the apogee and perigee that they planned. So it, the rocket performed excellently. The Atlas V jet jettisons the payload fairing during first stage burn. The actual the payload fairing is wide and contains the entire second stage because the Centaur isn't strong enough to support the mass of the satellite on top of it. And you see that semicircular piece that just dropped off? That's called the Centaur forward load reactor. It transfers the load from the Centaur onto the uh, payload fairing so that it can support the larger masses. Because it was an interplanetary launch, the spacecraft has to initially launch into a parking orbit with the correct inclination and orientation around the Earth. So it does that through the staging, you get the RL-10 hydrogen oxygen rocket engine pushing it into orbit and then it will sit in orbit for you know, up to an hour and a half honestly depending upon how far around the orbit it has to go. And only then after that does it relight the engine and accelerate it off onto its trip to Mars. And after the escape burn was complete, we got this nice bit of footage showing the separation of the cruise stage from the Centaur upper stage. At this point, the spacecraft are not on a particularly good course for Mars. They will miss it by quite a large amount because they don't want the Centaur upper stage to actually hit Mars because it hasn't been cleaned up. The cruise stage will perform another maneuver once it's in deep space to make sure that it uh, actually targets its landing site, which is Jezero Crater on February 15th, 20, 18th, 2021. As it headed off into deep space, amateur astronomers were able to photograph it, including this uh, video by Gianluca Massi of the Virtual Telescope Project. You can see it in the middle there. Perseverance is one of three spacecraft going to Mars this year, the other two being Tianwen-1 and Hope. And the target on the surface of Mars is what we believe used to be an old lake. It's called Jezero Crater. And like many craters, it's like a big hole in the ground, so it would water would collect. But we know that this one was a lake for a long time because we can see inflow and outflow channels. And at the inflow channel, we can actually see a delta where sediment has been laid down for a long time. So this is an excellent place to look for sediment that's been laid down over time and therefore might actually have evidence of microbial life from the earliest days of Mars. And the meat of the science is of course going to be the mineralogy and the geology, but there's one instrument on this that I've been wanting to see on Mars for a really, really long time. So there have been three missions prior which tried to carry microphones to the surface of Mars. And they have all failed for various complicated reasons. So this time there's two microphones, one that will catch the audio during descent and one which will catch the audio of the laser 
hitting rocks as it performs sampling and your spectroscopy on rock samples. So I'm hoping that this time we will have audio for the sky crane descent. And the other thing is that this is a mission that has a long-term goal. It's going to be taking these core samples and storing them and stashing them on the surface for recovery. But hopefully in the next decade, the current target, if everything goes according to plan and gets funded, is 2030 for a return. And that would be a collaboration with Europe, building the rover to recover the samples and the spacecraft in orbit to return the samples to the Earth. And I want to talk about a uh, Mars sample return in a future detail-rich episode, but right now I want to look at a bunch of other things that you should be interested in. First of all, down in Boca Chica, Texas, thanks to uh, the camera work of Boca Chica Gal and uh, NASA Spaceflight, we get to see Starship SN5. And after several interruptions, a hurricane and various other problems, they finally got to perform a static fire of their single Raptor engine on that test stage. That's obviously good. Now they're looking at their data, they're planning on whether they want to be test flying this thing, and I believe they have already got temporary flight restrictions in place for the second. So quite possibly in the next few days, very likely in the next few week, the next week, we might see this thing flying quite a distance, and hopefully we will finally see it landing again rather than having some other problem. This isn't going to be a massive hop. This is going to have only a single engine. It doesn't have any aerodynamic control surfaces. And of course, SpaceX are already moving over to a new type of stainless steel. They built the SN7 test tank out of a new steel design. And uh, they're going to build a 7.1, which they hope will work at even higher pressure. But yeah, watch this in the next few weeks. There's a bunch of people covering it. There's uh, Lab Padre, S Padre, um, Everyday Astronaut has people down there. We have uh, NASA Spaceflight, of course, who I'm very grateful for the footage. Uh, could be quite exciting one way or another. One other thing that's happening this weekend is that Bob and Doug are coming home on board Endeavour. This is Bob and Chris Cassidy performing an EVA on the ISS earlier in the month, and they actually took a cool picture of the Dragon dock to the space station. So, the plan is to bring them home. There was some concern about weather in the area since there was a pretty big storm floating through, uh, you know, Florida. But it looks like there's going to be enough landing zones available. So the plan is they're going to undock at 7.34 p.m. Eastern Time on Saturday. And the landing should be 2.42 p.m. on Sunday. So they had to have at least, I think, two of the seven possible landing zones be okay. They had to have winds below 10 miles per hour, waves below a certain amplitude, uh, that, and these, are, of course, were very, very conservative measures, largely because this is a test and they want to make sure that everything goes according to plan. So this is still part of the test. That's one of the reasons why the undock might is building in extra time to make sure that they can perform all the checks and you know measure the performance of the vehicle. While it's been docked to the space station, they've been monitoring the health. The solar panels have performed better than the um, electro electrical people uh, had originally suggested, but then again, those people are famous for sandbagging their estimates, so doing better than the worst case estimates is nice, but it's not exactly earth shattering. But yeah, we're going to see them home on Sunday, and of course, they're now planning to move ahead with Crew 1, which will have a crew of Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover, Suichi Noguchi, and Shannon Walker. And they also announced the crew for Crew 2. We've got Robert Kimbra and Megan MacArthur from NASA. And Megan MacArthur, you saw at the DM-1 uh, launch, because she's married to Bob Benkin. There's uh, Akiko Hushide from JAXA and Thomas Peskiot from ESA. So that's looking far ahead, and that certainly isn't flying until late 2021. And there's a good chance that by then, Boeing will have their right to the space station working. Finally, you might remember Astra, the little rocket company based in uh, Alameda where they used to keep the nuclear vessels. Well, uh, there's a good chance that they will be attempting another rocket launch this weekend, but it sounds like there's not going to be a live stream like there was last time. Uh, this is going to be their fourth rocket. The first two failed. The third one failed to launch in time, and then it had some sort of incident that caused a fire near the pad. 
And then they went quiet for a couple of months. And now it looks like they've got another rocket to launch. Again, it'll be from the Kodiak launch facility up in Alaska. I really hope it's successful because they have been sort of quiet and secretive. And I would really like to see an Astro rocket flying in some form or another. And yeah, the ones that did fly and failed, they haven't shared any of that imagery, unfortunately. So yeah, uh, look forward to all of this this weekend. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.